In this video, we'll describe the role of the four layers of the TCP IP stack, describe the role of sockets, and be familiar with the role of the media access control address. The first thing to understand is networking is a complex operation. There's a whole series of things that have to be taken into consideration when networking together different computing devices. Some of them are shown on the screen now. So how do we make sure everything on this screen is taken into consideration? Well, the first thing to understand is the concept of layers. This is where we divide the complex task of networking into smaller, simpler tasks that work in tandem with each other. The hardware and or software for each layer has a defined responsibility, and each one provides a service to the layer above it. The advantages of layering include reducing a complex problem into smaller subproblems, devices can be manufactured to operate at a particular layer, and products from different vendors can work together more easily. TCP IP is one of the most important protocol stacks in use today. The TCP IP stack refers to a set of networking protocols consisting of four layers working together. All incoming and outgoing packets pass up and down through the various layers. The original TCP IP model had four layers. The updated model has five, breaking the link layer into two, data link and physical. There were very few physical connection options when TCP IP was originally conceived. Now we have twisted pair, Wi Fi, fiber optic, and more. Originally, it didn't make a lot of sense to split physical connections from data delivery, and today it makes more sense to do so. As the four layer model is perfectly sufficient for A level, we'll stick with it for the sake of simplicity. So let's have a look at what happens at each layer. The top one is the application layer. This is where network applications, such as web browsers or email clients, operate. It includes such protocols as FTP, HTTP and HTTPS, SMTP and IMAP. Next, we have the transport layer. This layer is responsible for setting up communication between two hosts. They agree settings such as language and packet size. This is where protocols like TCP and UDP sit. Next, we have the network layer. This layer addresses and packages data for transmission and routes packets across a network. This is where the IP protocol sits. And finally, we have the link layer. This is the rules related to the network hardware and the actual connection port standards. Operating system device drivers also sit here. And this facilitates the transmission of binary via any media, whether it have to be over copper, twisted pair, fiber, or Wi Fi. So let's have a look now at a message being sent from one system to another and how it passes down through the various layers of the TCP IP stack on the way out and then back up on the way in. So we have a message. Computer systems analysis is like child rearing. You can do grievous damage, but you cannot ensure success. We're going to pass this message down through the layers of the TCP IP stack to see what happens to it at each stage before it's sent onto another device via the network. So the application layer is first, and it uses an appropriate protocol relating to whatever application is being used to transmit the data. But we're going to say that this message is being sent via web browser. So the list of appropriate protocols would include HTTP, HTTPS, FTP. And you can see we've added that protocol information to that message. We now call this a segment. We now go to the transport layer. This uses the TCP part of the stack, as well as other conversation protocols like UDP. It's responsible for establishing an end-to-end -end connection and maintaining conversations between application processors. These protocols use port numbers to track sessions and add this information to the header. Once the connection is made, the transport layer splits the data into packets. It adds to each packet its number or sequence, the total number of packets, 
and the port number that the packet should use. Packets are numbered so they can be reassembled in the correct order at the other end. The network layer uses the IP part of the stack. It adds to each packet a source IP address and a destination IP address. All routers operate at this layer. They use the IP address to find out where the packets are heading. We now have what's known as a socket. A socket equals an IP address along with an appropriate port. We now know the device the packet is being sent to, the IP address, and the application on that device that needs the packet, that's the port. The link layer represents the actual physical connection between the network devices. It's responsible for addressing unique media access control or MAC addresses of the source device and destination address. Transmitting data between routers over a wide area network, the MAC address is changed at each hop on the route. So let's talk about MAC addresses. Every device on a network has a network interface card or a NIC. Every NIC has a media access control or MAC address, which is used to route frames on a local area network. A MAC address is made up of 48 bits. To make them easier to read, we typically represent this as six groups of hexadecimal digits. It's hard coded during the manufacturing stage to every single network interface card. From a MAC address, you can neatly identify any device, a printer, mobile phone, router, laptop, tablet, gateway, whether it's wired or wireless anywhere in the world. The first set of six hex digits, so that's three bytes, are used to represent the unique manufacturer code. The second set of six hex digits are used to represent the unique serial code for the device. While the IP address can change, the MAC address assigned to a NIC is unique, static, and set by the manufacturer. If the NIC is replaced, the MAC address will also change. So why do we need both a MAC address and an IP address? You may be wondering why we need two different forms of addresses. After all, we don't use that. Communication between two devices on the same local area network only requires the link layer, which creates a frame using the MAC address. But communication between two devices on different networks, say a WAN, requires both the network layer, which uses the IP address to create the packet, and the link layer. In practice, modern LANs also make use of IP addresses, treating the local area network as if it was a wide area network. I probably still haven't answered your question fully, so let's look at an analogy. Every physical device should have a unique MAC address. However, for a router, storing the references to every MAC address in existence would be unimaginable. It would take too long to find a particular address to decide which connection to route traffic down. Therefore, switches learn and store MAC addresses for connected LAN devices only, while routers cache some IP addresses. In essence, this is quite similar to how we'd address a letter. Your MAC address tells me who you are. The IP address tells me where you are. Say you want to send a message to another device on a local area network, but you don't know which one. It's perfectly fine just to use the MAC address at this level. Think of it like being in a classroom. You want to talk to Sarah, but you don't know who Sarah is. You can simply call out or broadcast to the rest of the class, who is Sarah? Everyone hears your broadcast, but only Sarah replies. Sarah has, in essence, given away who she is, her MAC address. Note that MAC addresses need to be unique, otherwise what would happen if there were two Sarahs? This approach can't possibly work on the internet because there are far too many devices. Using our analogy, Sarah won't even be able to hear you. You can't simply broadcast out to the whole world in the hope that Sarah will respond. In essence, the IP address tells us roughly where we need to head, even if we don't know the specific person or device our message is for. 
Now, although this example is highly abstracted, it helps to explain why we need both MAC address and IP address to route traffic over a wide area network like the internet. If the two hosts are on the same network, delivery is simple. One host can simply send to the other. A host may need to broadcast first if it doesn't already know the destination MAC address and the ARP protocol can achieve this. As traffic passes through the switch, the switch examines source and destination MAC addresses and learns which address applies to which device, eliminating the need for broadcasting in the future. Modern routers are both routers and switches, performing both LAN switching and WAN routing. If the hosts are on different networks, for example sending something over the internet, the data will be transmitted via a router. The destination MAC address will be the address of the router. When the frame reaches the router, the router will work out where it needs to send the packet by looking at the destination IP in the header. The router then sets its own MAC address as the source and the next device as the destination. The router can also use ARP to find the destination MAC address if the router doesn't already know it. If there are several routers on the path to destination, the source and destination MAC address will be overwritten or updated at every hop. So now let's go the other way. The original message is split apart and wrapped up in segments. These segments are then wrapped up in packets, which in turn are wrapped up in frames. Once the frames reach their final destination, they will travel up through the layers of the TCP IP stack in reverse order, stripping off the headers and tails as they go. Finally, the destination application receives the message. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key questions. What does protocol layering mean and why is it needed? What is the TCP IP protocol stack? And what is the difference between a MAC address and an IP address?